Good evening and welcome to the November 13th, 2019 Scarborough Zoning Board of Appeals. If you could all please rise and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance. To the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, Here. Here. Good evening. As you all know, this is a public proceeding, and unless the board specifically votes to go into an exec executive session, the public has the right to hear everything that is being said and to review all the exhi exhibits that are being presented tonight. Please notify the chairperson if you are unable to hear the proceedings. The board will work through the prepared agenda and will take up tonight's items in the following order. We have four appeals. Appeal number 2672, which is a special exception appeal for 34 Powder Horn Drive. It should require a board action to change oh, okay. the agenda. You just said so, you work from a prepared agenda, so <laughs> now you have to change that. Sorry. First, we're going to vote to uh, move to uh, amend the agenda, and we're going to move the approval of the minutes and the approval of the draft written decisions from last month's meeting and put them after the appeals. Do I have a motion? I'll move to approve. I'll second. All in favor? There we go. Back on track. So, as, as I said, their first appeal is the 34 Power Horn Drive, which is a special exception appeal for home occupation. And then we have appeal number 2667, which is a request for reconsideration of an appeal for 5 Pasker Avenue. Appeal number 2673, a special exception appeal for 192 Payne Road. And appeal number 2674, a variance appeal for 287 Gorham Road. In each instance, the burden of, is upon the applicant to demonstrate compliance in each of the criteria or provisions of the applicable appeal. The board will ask questions as necessary to understand the nature of the appeal as fully as possible. When all testimony has been heard, the chair will close the record and the board will adopt finding of facts for each criteria of the appeal and vote to determine if the applicant has met the burden of proof to meet the criteria. It is important to note that if any of the appeal or special exception criteria has not been met, the board must deny the appeal or the application. In many cases, the applicant or the landowner may have a personal problem which prompt the request for the variance. Please understand that this is not legally relevant to the appeal, no matter how sympathetic the board may be to the applicant's situation. After the board votes on the merits of each criteria, a motion may be made to approve the appeal. If there is a second, a discussion will follow. The board will then state conclusions of law based on the findings of fact to support a decision on the motion. A general vote will then take place on the appeal. If a majority of the voting members presented vote in the affirmative, the appeal is approved. If the majority of the voting members in the negative, the appeal is denied. The board's decision stands as of the date of the vote was taken, regardless of the approval of the final written decision. Generally speaking, appeals from adverse decisions must be filed with the Superior Court, except as otherwise provided by law, within 45 days of the Board's decision. Again, we remind everyone that this is a public proceeding, and you have the right to be heard and see what is happening. All persons speaking will be asked to first state their name and address or affiliation, and all Board members and interested parties are asked to direct their questions to the Chair, which is me. Okay. So first we have appeal number 2672, which is a special exception appeal for home occupation <coughs> for 34 Powderhorn Drive. Uh, Mr. Longstaff, I don't know if you want to introduce this for us. Sure. Um, this is a special exception home occupation appeal. Uh, home occupations in most of our residential districts are approved only by special exception uh, from the Board of Appeals. Um, the applicant's looking to establish a home-based baking business. Um, and we'll have to meet the performance standards for home occupation uh, in Section 9V of the uh, zoning ordinance. Um, we're looking at uh, the zoning district of an R2, residential 2 district. Um, and I think with that, the applicant can present their case. Hi. 
Hi, my name is Alice Merrill. I live at 34 Powderhorn Drive. Hi. Did you want to give us a little background, or would you like to go right through the criteria? Um, tell us what you're doing here. It's pretty straightforward. Just want to be able to go through the right steps to be able to um, sell special event cakes oh. and m mostly cakes, cookies, that kind of thing from my house. Standard for special exceptions. <clears throat> the proposed use will not create unsanitary or unhealthful conditions by reason of sewage, disposal, emissions to the air or water or other aspects of its design or operation. Um, due to the nature of this business, it's just me baking in my house, which I'm already doing, so it will not be um, creating any un unsanitary conditions. B, the proposed use will not create unsafe vehicular or pedestrian traffic conditions when adding to the existing and foreseeable traffic in its vicinity. It will not. It's not going to be a, um, a retail store or anything. There aren't going to be people coming there to shop. It's just it won't be uh, creating pedestrian, pedestrian traffic or um, there may be occasional people stopping in to pick up something, but that will be um, not a daily occurrence. C, the proposed use will not create public safety problems which would be substantially different from those created by existing uses in the neighborhood or require a substantially greater degree in municipal fire or police protection than existing uses in the neighborhood. To the nature of the business, it will not create a public safety problem. D, the proposed use will not result in sedimentation or erosion or have an adverse effect on water supply. To the nature of the business, it will not um, result in any erosion or water supply issues. And the E, the proposed use will be compatible with existing uses in the neighborhood with respect to physical size, visual impact, intensity of use, proximity to other structures, and density of development. There will not be any physical changes to the structure. F, if located in the shoreland zone. Um, are you located in the shoreland zone? I am not. G, the applicant has sufficient right, title, or interest in the site of the proposed use to be able to carry out the proposed use. I am a co-owner of the property. And you have your tax bill there, it looks like. H, the applicant has a technical and financial ability to meet the standards of this section to comply with any conditions imposed by the Board of Appeals pursuant to subsection 5 of this section. Yes. What do you current? Are you currently operating as a baker no. or no? No. Okay. <laughs> I. The proposed use will be compatible with existing uses in the neighborhood with respect to the generation of noise and operation hours of operation. It will not generate any additional noise. Okay. Are you going to have business hours or is it just kind of? No, no. How it's you, how it's, are you it's really generate business. It's really going to be. Um, based on um, event by event. So, you know, birthday parties, anniversaries, that kind of thing, as they come up, I'll be making the cakes for the individual events. Typically, it's weekend-based, so it would not even be a week-long process. You know, mm -hmm. it would be like certain days, and then I would be delivering on the weekend. Mm -hmm. um, now, will customers be picking up the products? Are you delivering them? What's I plan on delivering them. I can imagine um, there may be customers that want to see where I'm baking it. If they did want to stop in, that's certainly fine by me. But in general, I'll be de delivering. Mm -hmm. okay. Does the board have any questions at this moment? I have a question. How are you advertising yourself? This is a brand new business, so I'm not advertising at this mm -hmm. time. But uh, I think it mostly be word of mouth. I'm not looking to have a giant business here, just a uh, kind of small hobby-based business. Cool. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Okay. Do, um, I guess, uh, with regard to payment, uh, would you imagine you would do it online yeah. or just be? Absolutely online. Okay. Yeah. So, like, payments would happen online? Yeah. And, okay. Yep. Great. And so if we were to impose some sort of restrictions in that, you know, one of the things is you have the technical and financial ability. Mm -hmm. um, can you elaborate on how you would feel you'd be able to meet those? Are you currently offering another business or you have a history in baking or? Um, it's been a lifelong hobby of mine. Right. So it's, yeah. Okay. Yeah. 
I don't have a degree in baking, but. <laughs> <laughs> but you clearly must have people who already appreciate your talent. Yes. 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 Which is making yeah. you do this. Right. Yeah. Great. <coughs> yes. One, one quick question. Mm -hmm. So you say this is a hobby business yes. primarily. Okay. Yeah. You're not really looking to scale at any point here. It's just something that you're doing on a part-time basis. Right. Okay. Right. 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 Yes. Okay. So with a home, I'm sorry. Or with a home occupation, you have the performance standards. Mm -hmm. So what we're going to do is we're going to go through those, and if you can just answer the questions. Sure. Number one, the occupation or profession shall be carried on wholly within the principal building or within a building accessory thereto. Yes. And so where do you plan to be doing this? Just right in your kitchen? Right in my home kitchen, yes. And it looks like you submitted a floor plan, which shows what part of your kitchen here. Yep. It's usually customary to draw in the stove and the sink and the refrigerator so we can tell it's a kitchen. But okay. <laughs> I assume it's the 12 by 9 <laughs> yes, area. Yes, it is. Um, two, the home occupation shall be clearly incidental and secondary to the use of the dwelling unit for residential purposes. Yes. And so you currently reside there as your residence mm -hmm. with your family? Yes. Two, no more than one person who is not a resident of the dwelling unit shall be employed in a home occupation. There won't be any other employees. Okay. No. So if you were going to expand, there would be limitations on what you would be able to do there. Okay. Four, exterior signage shall be permitted in accordance with the home occupation sign provision under section 12, sign regulation, subsection E. I'm not planning on having an exterior sign. Okay. And if you do change your mind and you do want to have a sign, that's something that Mr. Longstaff and the zoning, and the zoning board can help you with. Okay. Five, there shall be no exterior displays, no exterior storage of materials, and no other exterior indication of a home occupation or variation from the residential character of the principal building. And this shall, pro this shall prohibit this, wow, what am I saying? Oh. Lobster traps. You're not having lobster no. traps. <laughs> no you're lobster not have, no. <laughs> You're not going to have anything outside. No ex you're not adding any sort of exterior storage or anything like that. No, I'm not. Six, the nuisance shall be generated, included, but not necessarily. No nuisance. No nuisance. Shall be generated, including, but not limited to offensive noise, vibration, smoke, dust, odor, heat, or glare. Not unless something goes terribly wrong. <laughs> Seven, the traffic generated by such home occupation shall not increase the volume of traffic so as to create a traffic hazard or disrupt the residential character of the immediate neighborhood. I will not. No, as you indicated before, your right. plan is to deliver the cakes. Yes. I would imagine as soon as they're ready, you want those out the door. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Eight, in addition to the off-street parking provided to meet the normal requirements, the dwelling adequate off-street parking shall be provided for the vehicles of each employee and the vehicles of the maximum number of users or customers the home occupation may attract during peak operation hours. There won't be any other employees. I can't foresee more than one person there if they want to, if they did want to come by. There's right. No, and it's just you. Just, I can't imagine yeah. turning out lots of cakes all the time. Yeah. Um, okay, number nine. The home occupation may utilize, A, no more than... 20% of the dwelling unit floor area provided that for the purposes of this calculation, unfinished basement and attic spaces are not included. And so Mr. Longstaff, you have this drawing here. Did you do the calculations? Uh, she did them and I checked them. Yeah. He double checked my calculations. <laughs> my math is good. There we go. <laughs> um, and not, there's no accessory buildings. Ten, home occupation may include retail sale, sales subject to the following limitations. You're not doing any retail sales, is that correct? No intentions of doing retail sales? You're not going to start, like, making cupcakes and selling them or things like that? No. That's not the intention, no. Mm -hmm. um, Eleven is in regards to fishermen and lobstermen. I don't think that applies to you. Nope. And number twelve is in regards to motor vehicle repairs, which also does not apply to you. I don't know if the board has any specific questions for the applicant right now. Is 
specific. So she's going to be the only one person working there and it'll be herself. And she's only said that she's going to have one person working there and it'll be herself. And uh, sorry, my mic wasn't turned on. And <laughs> um, they only anticipate one car arriving at a time if they do have a pickup. So it's not going to be really generating a lot of traffic here. This is right in my neighborhood. I'm actually okay. looking forward to smelling it. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> okay. Do we have any other questions from the board before I open it up to the public? No questions. Okay. I'm going to open it up to the public. I don't know if there's anyone here that would like to speak in regards to this appeal. Did we receive any letters or emails? We did not. Okay. I'm going to close the public hearing. Now the board is going to consider the evidence that we've been presented tonight and do our findings of fact. You, you can sit down now if you want. The board's going to discuss it. Mm -hmm. as a whole first, I guess, and then go back and do these? Um, or do I would do the, first? I'd do the findings and then just vote on the modifications okay. to me too. Okay. So the proposed use will not create unsanitary or unhealthy conditions by reason of sewage disposal, emissions to the air or water, or other aspects of its design or operation. Mr. Hebert? Now the applicant stated, I mean, it's due to the nature of their home baking business, they're not going to be generating a lot of hazardous chemicals or waste out in their backyard or anything like that. So um, due to the nature of what she is doing there, doesn't pose a risk to any uh, public or private water or sewer, or sewer septic. Mr. Bork? Agreed. Absolutely agreed. <coughs> and Mr. Kern no just on joined that. us. Yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah, as, as, as the applicant indicated, it's a small scale business that she's going to be doing operating individually. I do not see how this would have an impact. All in favor of A being met. B, the proposed use will not create unsafe vehicular or pedestrian traffic conditions when added to the existing and foreseeable traffic in its vicinity. Um. The applicant stated that she's not going to be uh, selling any items for retail, so that it won't be generating additional uh, vehicular traffic that's unfamiliar with the area going to her home. Um, there's going to be one or two cars coming over with a purpose to pick up their uh, pick up their deliverable, their their cake uh, or, or baked product, and going home. Um, and she's saying that. They estimate their orders to be one or two cars a day, which really isn't uncommon for this neighborhood given its density. Mm -hmm. Mr. Work? Yes, I would add that, uh, <clears throat> as stated uh, in the text here, that the majority of the baked goods will be delivered by the applicant, and it would really be a rare exception that anybody would ever pick something up, especially for something like catering mm -hmm. that normally gets brought to the customer. I agree with everything that's already been said. Mm -hmm. No further comment. All in favor of B being met. Aye. C, the proposed use will not create public safety problems, which would be substantially different from those created by existing uses in the neighborhood or require a substantially greater degree in municipal fire or police protection than existing uses in the neighborhood. Again, uh, folks or customers, are, if they do come to over to her home to pick up their product, uh, they're not lingering. They're picking it up and they're leaving. Um, the transaction time is a very small window for someone to go pick up their item and leave. Um, the applicants also stated that they're not looking to hire any additional employees. It's going to be solely run operation by herself. Um, so it's not going to be an additional vehicle in her driveway or parked on the street or something like that. It'll be her own personal vehicle. Agreed. Yeah, I think any vehicular tra traffic <coughs> at all would be very similar to uh, getting a delivery from a from UPS or, or FedEx at the same time. So I think that there's no differentiation here that's required. No further comments. 
Yeah, I mean, due to the nature of the home-based baking business, I don't think this would create any substantial different public safety problems. All in favor of C being met? D, the proposed use will not result in sedimentation or erosion or have an adverse effect on water supplies. Uh, due to the nature of what product that she's creating, it's, it's really, there's maybe some additional water consumption, but nothing out of the ordinary for a residential home of its size. Yeah, agree, there's minimal impact. Yeah, I think there's, there's very little difference between what would normally be done in a household kitchen versus what's being done in this situation. Mm -hmm. No <coughs> concern about sedimentation or erosion. Right, and as the proposed use does not require any additional construction and is, con is totally contained within the existing dwelling, it would not result in any additional sedimentation or erosion or impact the water supply. So all in favor of D being met? E, the proposed use will not will be compatible with existing uses in the neighborhood with respect to physical size, visual impact, intensity of use, proximity to other structures, and density of development. Uh, the applicant stated that they're not going to have any physical strain changes to their residential dwelling or structure. Um, they have the uh, option if, if she would like a sign in the future and uh, just has to abide by certain rules in the, in, the, in the ordinance that's already spelt out, but she said she's not even going to have a sign. Um, there's not going to be a, all the goods are being, um, a lot of the goods are being sold online, so there'll be fewer cash transactions, I would imagine, on site. Uh, there's really no exterior impact whatsoever. Right. As someone who's seen cakes and, and bakery items brought into restaurants and, and other uh, settings that are entertainment venues or whatever, I, I've, I can't imagine anything going on in this house that's going to be any different than what wouldn't be normally normal course of um, living. Right. No further comment. Okay, all in favor of E being met. F, it's located in the shoreland zone. I can verify that it is not in the shoreland zone. Okay, all in favor of F? I believe oh. Brian. G, the applicant has sufficient right, title, or interest in the site of the proposed use to be able to carry out the proposed use. Uh, she's provided a tax bill, and I imagine uh, Mr. Longstaff, the town's confirmed that the tax bill is accurate as, as they have presented it. I didn't check to see if she's paid her taxes. No. Okay. <laughs> I presume that somebody did check to make sure that the deed and the tax bill matched up. Is that fair? Um, she's the record owner, so I didn't go any further than that. Okay. Yeah, I agree. Sufficient proof has been provided. Yep. No further comment. Yeah, so typically a tax bill is sufficient to show title. So all in favor of G being met? H, the applicant has a technical and financial ability to meet the standards of this section and to comply with any conditions imposed by the Board of Appeals pursuant to subsection 5 of this section. I wouldn't imagine that we would be imposing, if any, um, uh, restrictions on this. Um, we're on letter H, correct? Correct. Yes. Um, the applicant said that it's a hobby business, so clearly she's been doing this for a long time and has most likely accumulated a significant amount of equipment that she needs to operate this business over time, so it's uh, not an issue. Agreed, it won't scale. Yeah, I don't see where there's any scaling issues here. No further comment. Right. You know, this is such a small-scale baking business, I don't see that any restrictions need to be imposed. So all in favor of H being met? That's fine. I. The proposed use will be compatible with the existing uses in the neighborhood with respect to the generation of noise and operation of hours. Vehicles, as she stated, the, for folks or, client, or customers who are coming by, <clears throat> Generally, they would be one at a time, and uh, one or two vehicles per day is, is not uncommon with the existing density of this neighborhood with all the, with all the uh, other residential dwellings that are there. Agreed. 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 
Right, and the, and the activity is going to be conducted entirely within the dwelling, and few customers will receive their orders at the res residence, and the generation and noise and operation hours will not appear to be significant. And so if the activity should grow or change so as to receive customers for retail baked goods, which I was kind of asking about, um, the ac applicant must reapply for an amendment to the special exemption home occupation and address those different impacts. All in favor of I being that. Okay, so we went through the performance standards for home occupation. Uh, if the board's okay, I'm going to ask them if we can vote on them wholly as one. I don't know if they have any questions, or if they wanted to address any of the special criteria, or if we could just vote if she's met all those. Okay. I'm fine with that. All in favor of the home occupation criteria being met? Okay, I have a motion. I'll move to approve appeal number 2672 as presented. I'll second. All in favor? That's fine. Congratulations. Good luck. Do you have a name for your business? Um, okay. <laughs> we'll be looking for you, though. <laughs> Cookies at four minute men drive would be nice. <laughs> <laughs> Next, we have appeal number 2667. Nope. Yes, 2667, which is a request for reconsideration of the ZBA decision that was issued last month. And this is by for 5 Tasker Avenue. I'm going to ask Mr. Longstaff to give us a little background, please. Okay, this is something the board doesn't see very often. Um, <coughs> there is a uh, provision in state statute that allows. Um, for a uh, board to grant a motion to reconsider if they so deem it um, necessary. It's up to the appellant to um, meet some time frames. They, they must make uh, the request within 10 days, which um, the appellant has done in this case, and uh, that's within 10 days of the decision back in um, October, <coughs> on October 9th. Uh, the board has 45 days to make the decision on whether it will reconsider um, uh, the uh, decision on uh, the appeal. Um, that time frame will be met tonight if, if the board chooses to vote. Um, so the statutory limitations or, or time periods, I guess, have been met. Um, the board is in no way obligated to um, entertain the motion to reconsider. Um, and they are absolutely within their right if they wish to make the motion to reconsider. Um, it's really upon, um, uh, incumbent upon the appellant to demonstrate to the board that they have uh, some compelling reason why the board should um, reopen or, or reconsider the decision that it made. Examples of why might be um, if there's an alleged misinterpretation of the ordinance uh, or if there is new and compelling information that wasn't available or presented at the time that the, the appellant feels would address um, any criteria that, that um, wasn't met. Um, but again, if the, if the board does not wish to entertain that motion, they do not have to. Should the board wish to entertain that motion, then the motion to reconsider should be made. If it is not seconded, it dies. If it is seconded, then a vote will be taken. If the vote is in favor, 
then the appeal may be reopened and it can be reopened at any later date that the board so chooses. It does not have to be reopened tonight. Um, if the board votes not to approve, the motion dies and it's dead. Are there any questions? So, um, based on our town attorney's instructions, I think we would allow the appellant about a couple of minutes to tell us why they think that this motion should be, a motion to reconsider should be granted or warranted in this case. We will hear no new evidence until a vote is taken. If the vote is taken and it's favorable, then evidence can be heard at a later date. Um, so the appellant is not to provide any new evidence now. They're to, to provide an argument to the board as to why they feel the board should uh, uh, open a, a motion to reconsider. Mr. Fisher, good evening. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. For those of you who know me, you know I don't normally talk <laughs> like this. Oh, so, Can you stand closer to the mic? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Hopefully that'll be a little bit better. Um, it's, it's just a cold that in this case happened to settle in my throat. So please uh, don't be afraid to say speak up a little bit more. I'll do what I can. Um, in the interest of brevity, obviously, from Brian's comment, uh, when we were here last time, we did receive uh, approvals for the first seven criteria or conditions for the practical difficulty variance that we were looking to receive. Um, we got to then the, the latter two conditions or criteria, I should say, which were uh, no practical alternative and a, um, an economic injury. And at the last month, um, I, would, I presented last month, as you may remember, and uh, I was not prepared to address those two specific criteria. Um, we've been here many times, and I recognize many of you, most of the time that's been a hardship variance, and we haven't been here for quite a while for a practical difficulty. And uh, in my letter that you've probably seen for request for reconsideration, I did state that I was a little bit uh, off in terms of not being able to respond to that criteria. And there is some information that we do have uh, toward that end that we would like to be able to present to you. Being what it is, it's information that you did not have available to you last time. And given this uh, this evening, we'd like to be able to just uh, present that the criteria for those two conditions if we could. Thank you. I believe the information that you submitted is what you're asking us to reconsider. And that's what, with, in regards to the attachments and things like that? Um, I believe so. Um, I'd like to thank Brian, first of all, because he worked with us um, uh, toward this end. As he mentioned, we did get our letter in. There were, uh, because our, uh, our um, applicant is not f from the immediate area, we didn't have access to the house. One of the things that the board members brought up in terms of practical alternatives was, uh, well, could a deck actually go out the front of the house, for instance? And uh, that's information that uh, we didn't have at the time that we submitted the letter and uh, Brian, because we couldn't get into the house at that point, and that's when Brian was willing to work with us. So anyway, toward that end, I do, I do appreciate that. Um, so you should have in your packets, and if not, I have extra copies here of the layout of the internal uh, portion of the house that we can discuss as far as the no reasonable alternative. And then uh, the applicant and uh, um, the applicant's counsel is also here this evening to talk about the economic injury portion of this, mm -hmm. which is information we didn't have before as well. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. So as Mr. Longstaff indicated, um, I, I think, I don't know, Mr. Heber and I have probably been on the board the longest here, and we've never seen one of these before. And so what we kind of have to do here is kind of think about what we're doing. And um, so one of the things that stick out to me and what Mr. Longstaff addressed in his memo this month and was the fact that the memo that the applicant received back in October did actually address some of the issues that they're saying they were unaware of. Um, specifically, I think, and again, the memo highlights that the memo that we issued on October says, in addition to the seven variance criteria, the practical difficulty variance also requires the applicant to demonstrate to the board that the applicant application of the dimensional standards would preclude the use of the property that is permitted in the zone and would result in a significant economic hardship. So I want the board to understand that the memo they received the week before <coughs> did inform them that this was some of the criteria that we now consider and are going to be looking at. My other understanding is that the applicants were meeting with the planning and zoning administrators before they even wanted to get a permit back in 
April, August, I don't know, earlier this year, and they were specifically told they would need a variance. And instead of getting a variance, they started building a deck, um, even though they were specifically informed that they needed to. And one of the other things that I wanted to point out was some of the some of the additional in, uh, evidence that was submitted was in regards to the economic hardship that the applicant is saying they incurred in regards to, I don't know how else to word it, but their mistake of building a, a deck without a permit. Um, that, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to get into case law and things like that, but my significant hardship isn't in regards to getting a survey and the mistake of starting a building a deck when you didn't have a permit and things like that. Um, I know I, I don't know if the board has any other comments about this. Thank you. Yeah, I'll, Please. If I may, uh, I think we addressed this issue very uh, succinctly <coughs> last time that the, the hardship was self-inflicted and that's really the only hardship that we saw. Mm -hmm. uh, there are really two parts to the, the eighth criteria. Uh, one is economic hardship, and as I, as I recall, the other part uh, is, uh, and Brian, help me with this large you would. It's, it's if it precludes a use that's otherwise permitted in the, in exactly. the district. Yeah. And what it says specifically, and, and if I'm correct, is that the applicant has to demonstrate that both are true. Okay. So in this particular case, I think we, at least in my opinion, my take was that we viewed it we viewed that um, there was no economic hardship here, and that we really didn't get into that kind of detail in terms of precluding, you know, the use, uh, you know, in that particular location. Uh, so I think it's really it's a matter of economic hardship that we should be considering more than anything else. Mm -hmm. uh, and to me, I think we covered that pretty carefully last time, and uh, I'm not sure we should really be open to reconsideration. No, I, I would agree that we very thoroughly covered that, and um, I, I think we covered it too with the, with the an aspect of trying to trying to figure out a way to make that you know we'd, we'd really like to be able to make the justification that the that you could do what you wanted to do with the property, um, but. You know, I, I think there were just there were too many things that just did not fit into our criteria for making that decision, and one of them was the economic hardship. And I would agree that the the economic hardship was totally um, self-imposed. Um, May I speak to that, Madam Chairman? Is this appropriate? Um, not at this time. Uh, sorry, Jim. Um, my my issue with this is again we discussed this at length last time in the memo in the memo notes from the town the, uh, the eighth criteria was clearly stated uh, and again um, the the biggest issue here is that they they went out anyways and built this deck on their own and they went through with this process and had to be stopped by the town if I correct me if I'm wrong Brian yes. from proceeding any further um, and. To, and to me, there, there is no economic hardship. Everything is self-inflicted. Um, so I, 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 I don't feel the need to reopen this because we did discuss it at length last month. Now, one more thing. Uh, we also discussed the uh, possibility of dealing with this as a uh, special needs, you know, handicap, mm -hmm. which could go straight to Brian for approval and not have to come th from, you know, to the board if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, thank you for bringing that up because we yeah, did thoroughly discuss factor, that as well. Uh, because that's really not for us to decide from what I interpret. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, I, I mean, my recollection is there are feasible alternatives, and that was actually what was said and presented that evening. Um, so do we have a motion to reconsider? Ms. Chairman, before that happens, can we just address some of the comments that the board made? I would say no. No. I, I, I think, you know, I, I feel like we did a very thorough memo. I mean, the, the memo clearly points out that, you know, the town met with the applicant or with their representatives back in April 
Um, I, I can't imagine an applicant would be unaware. I mean, they were informed a variance appeal needed to be done. Um, I can't imagine that they that would happen without her knowing. So, you know, the deck started without any of that. No permit, no variance <coughs> appeal, even though they were specifically informed that they had it to do. They hired professionals to do this. You guys did your due diligence. You presented to us. You gave us all of your evidence. Um, I feel like we discussed it thoroughly at that time. And um, no. Yeah, I feel, like, I feel like what you've submitted here was adequate for us to make a decision tonight, along with the other letters from abutters that we had as well. Mm -hmm. And I think we have all the information we need for. But that's not uh, what you just brought up is we didn't have that information last time. And if I may, um, so let me, just, let me just reiterate one yeah. more thing. Yep. This comes in two parts, okay, two parts. First part is, will the board entertain a motion to reconsider? That's what has been asked. Is there a motion to reconsider? No, no, no other evidence, including your attorney or the own, owner, is going to be heard until that vote is taken. If the vote is in favor, then we can hear evidence, but we probably won't hear it tonight. No, no. Thank you. I don't want to give no, evidence. Thank you. A I'm point really, of order. You have I'm not been. Really you have sorry. not been recognized really by the sorry. chair. Please okay. sit. Okay. So sure. I'm going to finish my explanation. So once that motion is taken, if that motion is in favor, then other information can be reconsidered. I think what Miss Torrens was. I don't know what Miss Torrens was referring to. You've provided a lot of different uh, information, letters, and 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 stuff, and it came in piecemeal, and it's all here. So if the board does choose to. Uh, entertain that motion, then that information will be entered into the record and considered. But we're not going to talk about that information, including the attorney's letter or anything else, until that vote is taken. So is there a motion, the chair has asked, if there is a motion to reconsider? I'd just like to read your comment, Mr. Longstaff, that makes I'm the sorry, process different. You have not been, have, has, has the, the chair recognized the attorney? No. Chair, would you I, recognize me to read one thing from I'm his really comments? I'm sorry. I, you know, we were told specifically this is the procedure. And again, I'd like to read the procedure because in his comment. The procedure yes. is that if we cannot convince the board that we have such compelling evidence, we haven't told you we about the evidence, evidence we, have, we have, then the board makes the motion on uh, whether it does, it does grants the motion to reconsider. And Thank therefore, you. we came here with just to tell you we have evidence not to present it right. that is different. And we'd like to just tell you right. what it is. Right. that we would present and right. before you do the motion, which is what right. the template is that uh, Mr. Longstaff, and so if I can just tell you one you. minute. Uh, no, I'm sorry. Chair. I, I can't because you actually, the, Mr. Fisher did present, in the, I mean, this is, I have to go back to Mr. Longstaff again because we're, we were getting piecemeal information and I, you know, I initially said I thought everything had to be due by the 20th. Everything had to be due. He had 10 days after it to do it. You know, you got us the letter within the 10 days. You submitted at that time new evidence to us. It's, and then we're getting piecemeal emails today, yesterday, and you want to present more. And again, you know, we have other applicants here tonight. We cannot redo the appeal. Mr. Longstaff asked like that this evidence I, be presented. Yeah. I did not ask for the you evidence asked, to be presented. You asked Mr. Fisher to do the you plan. You have to come with your evidence if it's going to be heard. But right. the vote has to be taken first. And unfortunately, Mr. Longstaff right. is actually not in charge. I'm in charge. Right. And so at this time, right. I'm going to, is there a motion? Madam Chair, if I can add one thing. Yes. Um, it's, it's important and, and critical for folks to understand I have, that. I think you have to make a motion. Just make a motion so we can. <laughs> I mean, I, I move not to reconsider. No, no, you can't do that. You, oh. you have to always make the motion in the affirmative. Gotcha. The motion has to be made. And then discuss it and then because vote Because we can't on. close the issue until that happens. Correct. So I will move um, motion to uh, reconsider appeal number 2667. Do we have a second? Motion is denied. Sorry. You can take it to the Superior Court, I believe. Next. <laughs> Not me. 
Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, no one's no one's really excited to hop right up there. One general one. If I can just <laughs> if, if I can just say one sure, thing real sure. quick, um, yeah. it's just. As for the folks here tonight and the public listening, it's very important that when you come here, you have one chance to state your case and state your facts. If you arrive with not enough information, you may table uh, the appeal for a following month. Uh, that was not done. Uh, you have one, again, you have one chance. You present your information. You just can't keep coming back and coming back. And that's not fair to you. It's not fair to anyone else who's here who's waiting patiently to have their application heard. Thank you for your patience. No, and, and again, for the public's benefit, uh, any decision that we make as a board can be appealed to the main uh, uh, judicial <coughs> court. Uh, that that's the recourse the uh, applicant has. You know, they will then uh, make a decision whether or not to uh, cons consider it. So yeah, there is a, there's an appeal process. Mm -hmm. Okay, appeal number 2673, which is a special exemption appeal for home occupation for 192 uh -oh. Payne Road. <laughs> <laughs> Do you I promise to make cookies like the last girl? <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm going to first ask Mr. Longstaff to give us a little bit of information. Yes, so much like the first appeal that we heard, this is a special exception home occupation appeal uh, for Carol Nelson at 192 Payne Road. Um, again, there are, this is a little different in that there are three sets of criteria that need to be met because the daycare, the home uh, daycare, has certain requirements and performance standards that are listed out in Section 4I of our zoning ordinance. Then there's the home occupation standards in section 9V of our ordinance. And, um, and then we also have um, the special exception criteria, the, the seven or so criteria for special exception. So it actually kind of comes in three parts and I believe I, I sent the applicant all that information. I didn't see a lot, of, um, a lot of information come back in the application so the board may need to question uh, you know, to get the, those uh, findings of fact um, in, in discovery here because uh, there wasn't an ample amount of information in the application. So I'll leave it with that and, and, uh, and uh, turn it back over to you, Ms. Okay. Ms. Gallagher, yes? Nelson. No, Nelson. Nelson? Am I looking at the wrong one? Mm -hmm. 2669. <laughs> I know. I'm just, I just wanted you to. We just didn't realize how much you didn't want to go. <laughs> I apologize. No, 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 no. Miss Nelson, I don't, do you want to give us a little bit of background before we get into the criteria? Um, what you're looking to do? First, I have to come before board. So I'm a little nervous. That's okay. fine. I owned a home daycare for 23 years in Massachusetts. I've had the house up here for a while, and um, I just wanted to open, open up a small home daycare in the home. And... Um, so I called the town first to find out what the ordinances would be before I even went any further with getting any kind of um, licensing done in the home. And as far as I know, this is my first step is to see if it's something that I could even move forward with. So here I am. Okay. So what we'll do now is go through the application criteria. You can just read your okay. answers, all right? Yep. So A, the proposed use will not create unsanitary or unhealth conditions by reason of sewage disposal, emissions to the air or water, or other aspects of its design or operation. Um, no, not based on this type of business. I'm not manufacturing, making anything, um, these small children and diapers, and I don't see that it will do that. Okay. B, the proposed use will not create unsafe vehicular or pedestrian traffic conditions when added to the existing and foreseeable traffic in its vicinity? Um, no, there'll be, um, of course, parents dropping off and picking up. You're, it's going to be a very small daycare, only a few of them. I'm on King Road. Um, there's a lot of traffic through there anyways, especially in the summer months. I don't even think anyone would notice a couple more cars pulling in and out of the driveway, to be honest with you. Yeah, I'm actually not quite familiar where 192 Payne It's Road about a mile down from is. Cabela's going towards um, Route 1, towards the um, Pine Point area. Okay. It's pretty bad down there. The traffic's not really great there. It's pretty fast. 
because you know the speed limit's 35. Mm -hmm. A lot of traffic down that road is pretty much a main cut route lately. <coughs> last few years. Is it a two lane road at that point? It is, yep. But they really, they fly on that road pretty bad. It is 35. It is 35, yes it is. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <coughs> C. The proposed use will not create public safety problems which would be substantially different from those created by existing uses in the neighborhood or require a substantially greater degree in municipal fire or police protection than existing uses in the neighborhood. No, not with this type of ordinance. Now what's next to you there on, on Payne Road? I'm on the corner of Side Street. And then there is a house on the other side of me. Which side? That's street? my house right there. Is that on, on the corner of Pilgrim? Is that what yep. it says? And yes. <coughs> okay. And they're put, is that right near where they're putting a whole new development? Right no, past that's the, further down. That's further down yes, a little down bit the on the same down. side of the road? Yes. Right. Okay. Yep. Now I know where you are. Uh, D, the proposed use will not result in sedimentation or erosion or have an adverse effect on the water supply. No, not building anything, not making anything. I don't see that happening at all. Okay, you're not making any sort of changes to the outside? Oh, no, substantial not changes. No, not building anything, no additions, no outbuildings, anything. Any playground equipment or anything like that that you're Just your basic playground equipment I'd have in there for any kids coming over, grandkids, anything like that. Just, mm -hmm. you know, a little playing around plastic. Is this your house that we're looking at right that now? That is my house. Very nice. Yes. So you have a... Is that a two-width driveway, a double? It, yeah, and it's got the turnaround on the other side. Yep. Like those horrible yes, pictures yes. are covering the other one, too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, E, the proposed use will be compatible with existing uses in the neighborhood with respect to physical size, visual impact, intensity of use, proximity to other structures, and density of development. Yep, because I'm not adding or building anything, so nothing's going to change right there. Located in the shoreland zone? No. Are you located in the shoreland zone? No. Ah, no. G. The applicant has sufficient right, title, or interest in the site of the proposed use to be able to carry out the proposed use. Yes, I am the only owner of the home. You are. You provided the deed. Thank you. H, the applicant has the technical and financial ability to meet the standards of the section and to comply with any conditions imposed by the Board of Appeals pursuant to subsection 5 of this section. Yes, I have a full-time job, and so I can do this. Okay. And you had indicated before that you, this is something that you had... <coughs> That's my career. Yes, I did. Good for you. Yes, I missed it. I want to do it again. Yes, it did. I, I have a very big need for it. Area. We do. I, I yeah. have two little kids here. I, I yeah. totally understand. I've the met a few people that are like, please open them. Yes. Well, now it's become yeah. a real issue. <clears throat> I, the proposed use will be compatible with existing uses in the neighborhood with respect to the generation of noise and operation of hours. Yeah, um, the hours are going to be during the day. Um, almost everybody in that neighborhood is at work. And um, it's just going to be for kids playing. And you will hear kids playing sometimes, but that's all. Right. I mean, that's a that's a family neighborhoods oh, behind you. So. I know people yeah. who live back of, there with kids. A lot of families have moved in recently. Yep, yeah. yeah. So. And so what would be your hours of operation? Um, I'm looking to probably be open 7 to 5, 7 to 5.30. Mm -hmm. Not really long hours. Okay. Just Monday through Friday? Monday through Friday, yes. <laughs> okay. And how many kids do you expect to care for? Four. I don't, I don't want to do a lot of kids anymore. I had a very large family daycare before. I did 10 to 12 sure. in Massachusetts. Um, I was younger. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't want to do that many now. But I just miss the kids, and I'd like to be at home doing it again. And mm -hmm. there's a need for it. Maybe a few before and after school kids, because there's a big need for that. Yep. And my neighbors are asking about that. And that's, that's all. Right. <coughs> okay. So what we're going to do now is go through the criteria for a home occupation. Okay. Okay. And so if you just want to answer those. Okay. 
performance standards for home occupation. Number one, the occupation or profession shall be carried on wholly within the principal building or within the building accessory thereto. Right in the building. Right inside the house. Okay. Are you using a, the whole house or a portion of there's, the house? Um, there's a finished basement that um, I want to use. Um, I haven't had the state licensure come out. I don't see why I can't use the finished basement. There's egress windows. There's the emergency exit. So that's what I'm planning on using. Okay. You provide us with... Two, the home occupation shall be clearly incidental and secondary to the use of the dwelling unit for residential purposes. Yes. So you currently reside there full time yes. and use that as your residence. Yes. <clears throat> Three, no more than one person who is not a resident of the dwelling unit shall be employed in the home occupation. Still plan. And so your plan, I think as you sort of indicated before, was you don't plan on ever expanding or no. having an employee. Not um, my understanding is even the state criteria sort of limits to how many kids one person can watch anyways. Yes, they do. And right. I don't even want to go up to that limit, to be honest. Um, I want to stay small. Yep. Small like that. Mm -hmm. I know the old pictures. My yard is like, can you see where I guess you can see Oh, it's just Google right. Maps. Is that a newer version? Here? It looks new because the house is blue. I just don't see why you can't see the I fencing. Think the house is blue? It is now. Oh, that's yeah. the new color. Okay. Yeah. But, and Brian, I think, if I'm correct, <coughs> the, the actual view is stamped with a date of 2015, if I can read that correctly yeah, so up that there. Yeah, that was before that. And there's a fencing on this property. Pure. Yeah, this is 2015. And there's a view then. That's really mm -hmm. cool. You go to that front view. Well, it it's going to look like whatever it, it looks like in 2015. It back and forth. Number four, exterior signage shall be permitted in accordance with the home occupation sign provisions under section 12, sign regulation subsection E. Do you plan on having a sign? Um, very small sign, just in the very front. Just um, that the name of it, so people can find it when they come, and I will make sure that it is within those regulations. Right, yep, perfect. Five, there shall be no exterior display, no exterior storage of materials, and no other exterior indication of the home occupation or variation from the residential character of the principal building. Mm -hmm. Number six, no nuisance shall be generated, including but not necessarily limited to offensive noise, vibration, smoke, Dust, odor, heat, or glare? No. Do you, do you know what, what age are you going to be looking to uh, a certain age? Three and under. Three and under? Yeah. Good for you. Yeah, and some babies. <laughs> Good for you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Seven, the traffic generated by such home occupation shall not increase the volume of traffic so as to create a traffic hazard or disrupt the residential character of the immediate neighborhood. <coughs> no, like I said, that's got to prove they're not a traffic. Like, it's not going to take up any traffic at all. Right. And with yeah. only three or four kids. Yeah, it's not gonna be a lot of traffic yeah. at all. <coughs> Eight, in addition to off street parking provided to meet the normal requirements of the dwelling, adequate off street parking shall be provided for the vehicles of each employee and the vehicles of the maximum number of users or customers the home occupation may attract during peak operating hours. Like I said, I'm the, gonna be the only employee and the driveway is plenty big enough for somebody to come in and drop off their kids. It has a turnaround so they can get out easily and there is a side street if they did feel that they wanted to pull on the side street during the night while they drop off their kids. Mm -hmm. And there's not gonna be any employees? No. Okay. Number nine, the home occupation may utilize A, no more than 20% of the dwelling unit floor area provided that for the purposes of this calculation, unfinished basement and attic spaces are not included. I, I, it's a small amount of the house. If you're, if you're planning on confining it to the area that you have in the basement that is 
less than 27 by 10 because there's a little cutout for uh, you're definitely under yeah, a sixth of the property value and uh, property area. area. Yeah. I have a quick question. I, I apologize. I missed it when you said at what age did you want to keep the kids up that you're going to be caring for? Basically three and under. Um, three and under. Do you anticipate uh, potty training at that point? There'll be, a, of course, there'll be a little bit of potty training at that point. Um, the only kids about two years old, mm -hmm. nine when they start to potty train. Yeah. So there will be some of that. So. Great. The, re the reason why I ask is for the just with re yeah, 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 with regard yeah. to sewage so and septic, it's all good. Many children there, and right. So, and I don't have a lot of people living in the house for the size of the house, so I don't see that that's going to be a problem whatsoever. Great. Thank you. And you mentioned, just on, on that related note, you mentioned possibly taking in school-age kids as well. Um, Would I, those I, be siblings of the, of the younger? That's what I was yes. expecting it to, okay. yes. Thank you. Okay. And the older kids that are school-age in the summer, that's what camp will be for for them, okay? <laughs> Absolutely. Okay. Uh, Ten, home occupations may include retail sales subject to the following limitations. You're not going to be doing any retail sales. Nope, You're not <laughs> number 11 is in regards to fishermen. Number 12 is in regards to motor vehicle repair. Nope, no, 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 no. none of those. Okay. Does the board have any questions in regards to the home occupation performance standards? Nope. Okay, and so then we need to consider... <clears throat> that we need to look at condition requirements on child and adult day care daycare facilities. So family daycare homes, group daycare homes, daycare center facilities, and nursery schools shall comply with the following conditions. One shall provide outdoor play or recreation areas as required by state regulations, which shall be in the rear or side yards only. Yes, it'll be in the rear and front. Um, the state also would have to come in and make sure it was, so it is. Correct. Now, you had said, the, you had said that there was a fence on the front as no, well. No, it's the back that's fenced. It's okay. a stockade fence around the entire back of this property. So okay. I don't know why. I think, Madam Chair, I think you can see it right here where the uh, cursor is. Yep. There's a fence. Oh, okay. yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, does it connect back to the house at some yes, point? Yes, it does. Okay. I almost see it. And, and is there a fence? Does it continue along the back side yes. of the property? Okay. Okay. I couldn't see the shadow. I guess I can see a little bit of a shadow a right there. Yeah. Yeah. And then on the other side, does it also yes. exist on the other side? And then right back to the house. Okay. Like maybe a gate right there. Gate is on the side by the side street. So on the other side. On the other side. Then. Yeah. yeah, but you said it, it goes along the back side of the property and then along mm -hmm. this side and then back to the Sorry, house again. Right. I guess what I'm trying to what I'm trying to illustrate here is there's a that fence comes up this street. Does yep. it, it goes yep. across the back. Yep. Does it come down this sideline as well? Yeah. And then does it come back to the yeah. garage? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Perfect. <laughs> 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 I keep <laughs> Number two, all outdoor play or recreation areas shall be fenced in. If a facility is approved during the winter, fencing shall be installed as soon as weather permits. And we already have that. Three, unless authorized by variance under Section 5B3, such facilities may be located <coughs> on lots which comply fully with the minimum lot area and minimum street frontage requirements of this ordinance or as follows. So, wow. I believe if we could read the survey plan, I have one 
which I can't, I believe it indicates that this is over 20,000 square feet of lot area. I bought the original too, it's huge. That's why I had a hard time with this. Would you like me to bring it up there so you can see it better? That's up to the board. I can show you. Well, sure, I'll, I'll take okay. a look at it. Yeah, yeah let's take a look. If he likes blueprints. <laughs> Yeah, it's hard to get those out. No, that's yeah, fine. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Okay, good. Yeah, so it's 125, 125 by 125. I think you could maybe over here in the middle Carol, I thought I thought that the sur the survey that you got showed that the lot size was over twenty thousand square feet. It had to be fifteen thousand. Was um, it fifteen? Yeah, because she was only on the phone. <laughs> and yep. I think okay. that Are you in an R two? Yeah, let me just check the yeah. zone. It's R. Is it R two? It's R two, so it has to be twenty thousand. That's not what this says. On a non-conforming lot of record in R two district, the minimum lot area requirement for a family daycare home is fifteen thousand oh, square feet. Yes. Okay. I'm sorry. Provided That's the right. lot is sewered. Yep. And you are sewered. Um, she's not sewered. That's why it had to be 20,000. Oh, no. no. That's why you told me I had to come here because it was all, you said it had to be 15. Okay. No, no. What I told you was the reason that you got the survey uh -huh. was to demonstrate it was very close to, to being 20,000. You're not on public sewer. You're on private sewer. Yeah. This allows you to have a lot of 15,000 if you're on public sewer, but your lot is not sewer. You have private sewer. So you told me that you got the survey and everything was good, but it's not good because if it's only fifteen thousand, you're not meeting the twenty thousand square foot lot requirement. When I spoke to you, we were under fifteen thousand, and you said, "Oh no, you have to be fifteen thousand." Because you thought you told me to come out fourteen thousand or something, and, I, and then you said, "Well, get the survey because we could be off or minus a few, and you probably you might have the fifteen thousand if you drive it forward." Because we talked about. Being that accepted, I, I'm sorry, I'd have to find the email, but I'm pretty sure that I, I'm pretty <laughs> well, sure that I read the specs. Yeah. That. That's what I was on the phone, which is why I did go forward with this. If yeah. I, you know, because yeah. that's what that's what you. So, so that's that's a problem. <laughs> <laughs> that's a problem. Um, and, and I'm sorry if, if if I screwed that up, and I very well could have. This this says fifteen thousand for a sewered lot. Mm -hmm. And you're not on sewer; you're on private septic. Yeah. So and where does it say where I, I, where does it mm -hmm. say it has to be to twenty thousand if it's okay? Good good question. So under section which uh, section five uh, section four I yeah. are you in sec you're in no. you're in the wrong section. No, here we are, right here. Um, so one of the very first things it says is unless under four I. A3, unless authorized by variance under section VB3 or 5B3, such facilities may be located only on lots which comply fully with the minimum lot area and minimum street frontage requirements of this ordinance, or as follows. On a non conforming lot of record in any district, the minimum street frontage, blah, 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 and then it goes on to say, for on a non conforming Actually, the first one is on a non-conforming lot of record in the R2 district, the minimum lot area required for a family daycare home is 15,000 square feet, provided the lot is sewered. And I underlined an emphasis, underlined that. Provided the lot is sewered. It's not sewered. It's got private on-site septic. That's, that's why that's a critical component. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I think what Mr. Longstaff is saying is because you're not sewered, you now are required to have 20,000 square feet to be approved. Yeah. Correct. Well, I knew I didn't have 20,000 yeah. right then. But well, the only other way that, work. and again, the only other way that you can get it with less than that mm -hmm. is if you apply for a variance which is, is hard to, that's hard to get. Um, the variance is a standard hardship variance that says you can't realize any reasonable return on the lot without 
um, the variance, and I don't know how you're ever going to prove that here. You're going to have to help me here. I'm not sure how we're supposed uh, to proceed if this application doesn't actually even meet the criteria to be before us. A question, Brian. Yeah. Uh, if if she were to uh, connect to public store, I don't know if that's even feasible. Can't do it. Right. Yeah, can't doesn't go down, down that far. No. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I can show you. <laughs> I can show you where the nearest sewer line is. It wouldn't be wouldn't be economically feasible out there. I don't mm -hmm. think. This catches up. Yeah. There. Mm -hmm. So there you can see the green sewer lines. Yep. Yeah. Okay. It goes into Bonnie Grove. And that's where it stops. Yeah. And even the new subdivision that's on beyond, uh, <coughs> down beyond them, right. is got all okay. private sewer. Oh yeah. It's not. It's not public sewer down there either. So. It's it's no there's no way she can connect to public sewer because it's just not available. Okay. Until they until if eventually if they could send it down that someday. Maybe someday. Yeah. Whoops. Yeah. I went the wrong way. I'm sorry. So, were we were we unaware until this point that this lot was under twenty thousand? I think is kind of. That was the, the reason why uh, Carol got the survey was. She needed to demonstrate that she met that criteria. And if that got confused in the conversation, my apologies. It does say 15,000 for sewered lots. Yours wasn't sewered. So I wanted to make sure that, you know, by the survey, by getting the survey, we knew exactly how many square feet you Yeah, had. Um, that phone call was 15,000, which is why I went, because I knew mm -hmm. it wasn't 20. I never would have gone this far. Mm -hmm. I said, oh, 15, I'm pretty sure it's 15. Because it was such an odd 14, nine something, according right. to the book. Mm. But unfortunately, you're in the you're in the R2 district. Mm. I mean, is, is that dependent on any number of children, or is there? I mean, I noticed that there's some reference here, and I'm. Yeah, that, has no, that has no that has no bearing on the number of no children. Bearing, okay. It's a, it's just a space and bulk standard okay. in the ordinance. Yeah, just check it. And um and unfortunately, you know, like I say. They, they do give, it does, the ordinance does provide different um, lot sizes for non-conforming lots that they must, they must meet. But, um, and, and in fact, we're going to have the same issue come up on the next appeal. Um, that's exactly what uh, the next appeal 2674 is all about. It's asking for that variance for that non-conforming lot size. Right. And that, but that's not what Carol's here for tonight. She's here for the special exception appeal, which also requires board action. Um, Oh. If I realized it was a 20, I thought it was a 15. I, I yeah, I understand. I'm, I, I don't know how that got time, misconstru so. misconstrued because <laughs> the ordinance was very clear and I was reading right out of the ordinance, so I'm not mm -hmm. sure what happened. Yeah, yeah I, I procedurally, how... I, I feel like... Yeah. I was going to say the same thing. Well, I mean, she could she could table and then reapply for the for the variance, but again, I, I don't know how likely it is that the board could grant a variance for that. Right, well, at least it gives everybody yeah. time, some time to yeah. Yeah. dig into it more. Yeah. So yeah. I make a motion to table. A second. All in favor? Thank you. Right. Thank you. Carol, I'll be in touch. Why don't, why don't we touch base here tomorrow? Um, or Friday, I'll, I'm Friday. out of the office. Yeah, let's let's talk on Friday, okay. and that'll give me a chance to, to look into my notes and see what okay, I have. Thank okay. Thank you so much. Sorry. 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 Sorry, we couldn't help you tonight. Oh, it's disappointing. Mm -hmm. <coughs> there's a lot of criteria, but apparently there's a reason that we have all those criteria and things like that. And um, it's a lot of information for the applicants to try to get together and stuff, and it's understandable. Mm -hmm. Next.
Next, we have appeal number 2674, which is also a variance appeal for 287 Gorham Road. Which... I'll take my stuff away from me here, and I can't make anything work. Okay, give me a second. Oh, what's the address on this one? 287 Gorham Road, and then when Mr. Longstaff is ready, I'm going to ask him to just give us the town sort of brief background of your application. Okay, thank you. Kind of already did it with the last appeal. <laughs> we'll do it again. We'll start over. Um, okay, so on your screen is the property uh, located at uh, 287. Um, <clears throat> This property um, at 287 Gorham Road has been um, pretty much in existence, or there's been a building on it since 1995. Um, it was first used as a property management company and then later on as a uh, personal service and retail sales business um, location. It has an existing approved um, site plan on file for those uses or for that latest use. Um, Ms. Gallagher approached um, the staff uh, about converting this use over to a um, group, uh, excuse me, a daycare center facility um, so that she could care for, um, I can't remember the exact number that she was looking at, but it was over 25, 25 to 30 kids. 32 to 49. Yeah. So, so under group daycare uh, facility, excuse me, daycare center facilities, again, if we go to the, the ordinance, um, section 5IC states that daycare center nursery schools must have a total lot area that meets the minimum standards for the district um, for the first 12 children plus 75 square feet for each additional child based on the maximum license capacity. So in the Running Hill District 2, um, where this pros uh, parcel is located, the minimum lot size is 40,000 square feet. This lot is only 29,499 square feet, according to the survey that was referenced in the appellant's site plan. Um, the lot is non-conforming, but could continue to support a retail sales or service business because there's no uh, lot size uh, curtailment put on, on those types of uses. The, the daycare center facility, however, in the ordinance, as I just read, does have a minimum lot size requirement placed on that use. Otherwise, if that isn't there, a non-conforming lot can be developed and used if the uh, use can meet the setbacks, the yard size requirements, and, and, and frontage, and some other things. But it doesn't necessarily always need to have the uh, minimum uh, lot size in order to be used as long as other um, applicable standards can be met. In this case, the ordinance is specific on how big the lot can be. So that's why I advise the client that um, the only way that that can, can be approved is through um, a variance um, granted by the Board of Appeals under Section 5B3. Um, um, I also noted in my comments that there is an existing septic system on site. Um, it's designed for 72 gallons per day. That would have to be upsized dramatically uh, to accommodate the uh, number of kids uh, that would be at uh, at this uh, daycare center facility. Um, so there are other things that would have to happen if this uh, variance were granted. It should still have to go back to the zoning, uh, excuse me, the planning board for site plan review to convert the use, make sure there's adequate parking uh, for that particular use and so on and so forth. So um, <coughs> with that, I'll turn it back over to you. Ms. Gallagher, would you like to give us information on what you're Sure. Um, so I'm currently under contract for the for the building pending, of course, this variance appeal. Um, the the most recent use of the building, it's actually sat vacant for well over a year at this point. Um, to the best of my knowledge, it's been well over a year. Um, it's it's sat vacant because it's it's not at this point. Um, it used to be a tattoo parlor is what the most recent use was, Leviathan Tattoo. They moved to a bigger um, building. The septic could only accommodate six employees at the most, um, and that's not including if they have, you know, the bathroom used for 
customers and things like that. 72 gallons doesn't give you much, as no. Mr. Longstaff noted. Um, the uh, zoning ordinances for Running Hill, Gorham Road, Transition District, RH2, were changed in 2014, July of 2014, and that was after the building had already been used as a tattoo parlor under the old regulations, which did not require the 40,000 uh, square foot lot requirement. Mm -hmm. um, now the zoning ordinance requires that for, um, because it's on-site sewage disposal, the 40,000 for single family dwellings, um, pretty much any use of the, of the building, um, presumably why it's sat vacant for so long at this point. Um, the building before the ordinances changed used to be a daycare. Um, for a while anyway, at least according to the town documents that I received. Um, the, the building, the way that the, the septic is, the 72 gallons, again, uh, doesn't really give you much in terms of uh, a reasonable use of the building because there's no, you know, up to six employees and that's if you don't have a public bathroom. Um, Maine obviously has Alley's Law, which says that you have to provide a public bathroom if somebody's having a medical issue or something like that. So the building as it currently stands um, does not support does not support that. Um, whether it would support a tattoo parlor, maybe briefly. Um, who wants another tattoo parlor? Or a CBD store. <laughs> I personally don't want either one. But <laughs> um, I live in Westbrook. I've been running an in-home daycare for the last two years. Um, I'm also an attorney who couldn't find childcare, so I opened up my own. Yep. Um, I am, I have currently have 12 kids. I'd really like to keep going with what I've been doing. I'm one of the only organic, local, nature-based preschools in the area in Westbrook. i um, been pretty successful over the last two years, and um, would like to be able to continue that Scarborough, especially with all the developments going on. There's going to be 3,000 new people and then 2,000 new employees um, <laughs> all within a half a mile of this building on Gorham Road. Um, as for the septic, I had someone out there today. They are um, expanding the septic to 776 gallons currently, so that will be more than enough for the full uh, roster of kids if I ended up having the full 49 plus the employees. Um, and the parking is, um, there's plenty of room for extra parking spaces. So, <clears throat> thank you for listening. Okay, thank you. Okay, so what we'll do now is go through the qualifications and the criteria here for a variance. And you can just read the answers that you've provided. Number one, the land in question cannot yield a reasonable return unless the variance is granted. Reasonable return does not mean maximum return. The applicant must demonstrate practical loss of virtually all reasonable use of the land if the variance is not granted. Reasonable return is not determined by personal circumstances of the applicant. Again, I mean, reasonable is moderate. Um, there, it's sat vacant for this long for a reason. Um, it's not a building that, again, with the septic size, through no fault of anybody's, the septic size is small as it is. It won't support um, much else the way it is currently now. Um, even if this were, this has always been a commercial building, but let's just say, for instance, somebody wanted to, to change it into a single family dwelling, they'd still have to get a variance because it's not 40,000 square feet. So any, any of these other um, uses are not, it still would need the 40,000 square feet. No, Madam Chair, um, that isn't actually correct. Okay. <laughs> um, again, it's a permitted use. There is no restriction placed on, on a non-conforming lot of record uh, for a single-family dwelling. They, they would only need the 20,000 square foot minimum lot size for a on-site private septic system. As long as they could meet setbacks to property lines, that mm -hmm. would be the condition. Mr. Longstaff, um, this is... Uh, Mr. King would like to just um, say a few words if that's sure. all right. Weinstein East Grand mm -hmm. Avenue, Pine Point. I'm representing the property owner there. Mm -hmm. We have been trying to market it for quite a while. Um, it's a little bit of a unique property yeah. in that it's actually not a house. I don't think it actually was ever a house. I think it's yeah, been a, right. 
commercial building over there. And there's kind of a mental dividing line when you go over the turnpike that people don't want to have their business on that side of it. So it's been kind of a struggle other than a, a home thing. And the prior use was um, a landscape company was there for quite a, quite a while. They had dump trucks and tractors and sanders and snow blowers, you know, littered all over right. the place. And um, so we're kind of in a hardship trying to get another use. And we kind of looked at doing single family, but you really have to tear that whole building down to do it. So it's kind of a good use because most, a lot of people live further out that way and there's a traffic pattern coming in where people would drop their kids off on the way to work by the mall or over at Hagus Parkway or South Bar office building and pick them up on the way back. So mm -hmm. it's kind of ideal and it's not really like a business being there because most of the other neighborhoods all residential homes further out. <clears throat> Two, the need for the variance is due to the unique circumstances of the property. This criteria applies to property, not to people or to uncommon conditions not shared by the neighborhood. So um, I think Mr. Weinstein um, just elucidated some of that, mm -hmm. but um, also there's, there's never been a residential use of the building also. Um, there is a daycare located at 245 um, Gorham Road as well creative beginnings, I think is what it's called. So it is consistent with some of the other things in the neighborhood. Three, the granting of the variance will not alter the essential character of the neighborhood. Um, I, there's a lot of things on that road. I mean, there's, there's, uh, well, again, but at least it's not a CBD store. But there's the um, golf course that's there. There's a doggy daycare. There's mm -hmm. a veterinarian's office. Um, there's a lot of different things in that neighborhood. And like I said, this has always been a commercial building since its very inception. So. <coughs> Number four, the hardship is not the result of an action taken by the applicant or a prior owner of the property. And hardship must be caused by the imposition by zoning restrictions, not an action taken by the property owner. Um, to my knowledge, there have not been any actions um, by the previous or the property owner, Mr. Weinstein. Board, have any questions? I have a question um, for Brian. Mm -hmm. So, correct me if I'm wrong, just historically speaking, uh, the principal structure was constructed and was operated as a commercial business before the 40,000 square foot lot size restrictions were put in place. I don't know that to be true. I was just looking at the ordinance and the, the daycare center facility um, criteria went into place in 94. I, I'm sorry, I was referring to the section um, uh, 20B, Running Hill Gorham Road Transition District, RH2. Mm -hmm. the, fo the following space and bulk regulations are applicable to conventional, conventional developments, and then the non-residential and mixed uses is 40,000 with on-site sewage disposal. So, it's, And I understand that the daycare also has the um, other mm -hmm. imposition of the 75 square right. feet, but that doesn't add much to the 40,000. 40,000 okay. is the, the bigger one to begin oh, okay. with. Okay, I see so. what you're saying. Yep. Um, and that was 71614, and that tattoo parlor um, was there, to, to the best of my knowledge, 2012. Yeah, you're right. So, so you're, you're exactly right. I'm sorry. I was, I was looking at the standards in there, but you're right. With the Running Hill 2 district, if you were now to convert it back to a single family, it would have to meet that 40,000. You're absolutely right. Or any I other non residential and mixed uses. Yeah, any, any of those. Yeah, any of those things. Um, you could convert an existing non-conforming use to another non-conforming use with a miscellaneous appeal, but that's not the that's not the case here because <coughs> the use is actually conforming. The use is fine. It's the lot size that that doesn't meet it. Uh, in other words, permitted permitted uh, uses include the daycare center facility, so it's a permitted use, but the lot size just simply doesn't meet it. Right. So whatever, yeah, whatever was in place back in '95 was. Um, apparently before um, the Running Hill 2, yeah, definitely was before the Running Hill 2, Running Hill 2 district was 
developed and those space and bulk yeah. standards were put in place. So, I, so yeah. theoretically, when the building was built prior to the newer standards taking place, it was conforming. It, it was, was actually in the B zone, the um, B commercial zone. So that's why there was a daycare there. There's mm -hmm. been property management, and then yeah. the tattoo parlor was the most recent. But now those are grandfathered in. They're not grandfathered because they've sat more than a year now. It, right. It's it's kind of weird. It could have been, but the they were not. The file actually shows that there was a daycare center approved, but I don't believe it was ever it was ever built or used as a daycare center facility because the first certificate of occupancy was for the property management company. Um, according yeah, to the Stearns owned it. Yeah. Okay. yeah. So I I think Carrie Anderson got approval for a daycare center facility that I don't think was ever built and used as a oh, daycare. Oh, interesting. Center. Yeah. Okay. Oddly, I. I don't know what that file. would be, but... So I, I don't know how all of that happened, but it, that was back in the mid-90s. I think 95 was the first certificate of occupancy for Stars right. that I saw. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I, I can't go... I, I wasn't here then, and I can't go back and really figure out how that all happened, but sure. um, uh, Ms. Gallagher is exactly right. Um, I stand corrected that you couldn't put a, a single-family dwelling there because of that 40,000-square-foot lot restriction. Right. So then there is... Yeah. And there's no way to pipe into the public sewer, no right, public Mr. Longstaff? Sewer. That's correct. No okay. public sewer past the, uh, past the turnpike. That's what I thought. Okay. And what do daycares require for a minimum lot size? So they only require um, a, an interior space of 35 square foot per, per child um, for the square footage of the building itself. Um, outside space has to be sufficient, uh, is what DHS uses for their licensing regulations. And in, with the center, it's a little bit different because they only one classroom can be outside at a time. Um, so they do, it's a little bit different than in-home in daycare where all 12 of my kids are outside at the same time in a center. It has to be one classroom at a time because there's different age groups. And have you, um, have you pursued any uh, initial um, applications with the state for licensing for the facility? So I'm, like I said, I'm already licensed in Westbrook. Um, the DHS caseworker or the licensing agent is Katie Danaher um, with DHS, and she has been out with me at that site uh, three times, and she's taken notes and told me what you know what I need to do to the building to get it ready for licensing. And, and everything on. essentially hinges because you're under contract for the property now to purchase it. Correct. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. <coughs> okay. Like the last appeal, we're going to talk about conditions for child and adult care facilities in Scarborough. So conditions required on child and adult daycare facilities. Family daycare homes, day, group daycare homes, daycare center facilities, and nursery school shall comply with the following conditions. One shall provide outdoor play or recreation areas as required by state regulations, which shall be in the rear. We're not here to, no, we don't sorry. do that. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Madam Chair, nope. let me interrupt you. I'm a little <laughs> off. It's been a long day for, for the chairperson. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, I made a note for myself to interrupt you. Okay. <laughs> we're not, we're in this particular appeal, we're not going through that because that does not require zoning board. We're oh. only here to heal, hear the variance. Got it. The four okay. standards for a variance. Thank you. And that's the sole sum total of our duties here tonight. Perfect. Okay. Less is more. <laughs> we like that. Okay. Does the board have any other questions for the applicant? No. Okay. So I'm going to open it to the public. Anyone that would like to speak tonight? No? Did we receive any letters or emails? I did not. Staff? I did not receive any uh, written <coughs> comments. Okay. So I will close the public hearing, and the board is going to go through the criteria and do our finding of facts and conclusions. Land in question cannot yield a reasonable return unless a variance is granted. Um, for this one, uh, typically I'm a very um, strict interpretation on this on this 
ask that the application, however, if I understand correctly, um, the building not lot needs to be 40,000 square feet, regardless if it's a commercial building or residential home. Is that correct, Brian? Um, for any other uses other than the existing use, um, which I, I, I'm sorry, I, I didn't believe that it had been vacant that long, but maybe I'm wrong on that. Uh, but anyway, um, it, I think if it was if it was not to change the use, if it was continued as a retail personal service or retail sales business, it could continue to operate as it is. But to convert to any of these other uses, um, then it, it then would have to meet that 40,000 square foot lot. Gotcha. Okay. I guess that's the. I guess looking at it from the perspective of if they're looking to convert this into something else, which conforms more to the eccentric character quality of the neighborhood, and I know those are different parts of this application, but generally looking at it as a whole, if you're trying to convert it to something else other than a tattoo parlor or another commercial shop, you cannot utilize the property for your intent. Um, as stated by the applicant and evidenced by um, other information in the area, it's mostly residential. I know there's a golf course nearby, but um, generally it seems to, the density is a lot more residential. Um, the proposed use and desired use of the applicant would keep it more in line with uh, the residential density that's in that area, rather than maintaining it as a, as a tattoo parlor or some other general store or commercial facility. Um, and separately, what delineates it in my mind from the previous application that we just heard from is that uh, it's not a, currently not a residential dwelling and they can't live in it whereas the previous application they could. And we're not comparing any, I don't mean to make any comparisons to here uh, establish any kind of precedence because that's not what we do. But uh, that's not a building that you could go and move into right now with subs without a substantial renovation to it, uh, which may trigger uh, other issues. Whereas if you're tearing down or doing a frame off restoration to that building, it may trigger you to require to have that 40,000 square foot for lot size. Uh, so those, those are my thoughts on this one at the moment. Um, I tend to, I'm, I'm leaning towards uh, uh, proving number one. Mr. Walker. Madam Chair, if, if you could indulge me, let me just read the purpose of the Running Hill uh, 2 District. And I, I just offer this out there for food for thought yeah. for the board as they deliberate on <coughs> these things. I think it's important and, and maybe we'll shed, maybe, maybe shed some intent. light on things. The purpose for the uh, Running Hill Gorham Road Transition District is to provide an area for the location of small retail business service and community uses, as well as a range of residential uses including multifamily dwellings and dwellings that are a part of a mixed use development. The goal of the district is to supplement the RH district, the Running Hill district, which is next door, uh, in fostering a high quality mixed use center with development at a scale and uses at an intensity which are compatible with the surrounding area. This medium intensity mixed use district allows a range of uh, land uses that are intended to complement the core development pattern and uses in the RH district as well as serve as a transition to the surrounding rural residential areas. The Running Hill Gorham Road transition district shall be considered a business district whenever this ordinance distinguishes between types of districts. I just think it, it might be helpful for the board to kind of get that in context and it's, it's certainly a it's a, a zone that's sort of in transition, and mm -hmm. that was the that was the vision of the town, and and I certainly think it just and this is just my opinion. I certainly think a daycare center fits within Absolutely. that description. Cool. So right, I'm just right. offering that out yeah. there for food for thought. And let me add, I'll add to my answer. Um, you said it's uh, community use, residential use, high quality mixed use district, something that complements the surrounding districts and the dwellings and lots that are in that area, which a lot of it is a, a, a dense residential use, something that would complement, that would co come under the category of complementing um, the existing uses in that area would be a daycare facility. And as it currently states, standing, 
as the lot currently is right now, um, they cannot that that lot is essentially useless to be used for a daycare facility unless this variance is granted. That's my thought. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> let me uh, add to that. Uh, first, of all, I do concur. This is a as a mixed use area. Uh, it is still clearly a business area, uh, and in this particular case, we have a business that's providing service to the surrounding residential areas, which is really exactly what this is, this zoning district was uh, was designed to do. Uh, so, for me, this this is very very compatible uh, as a, a proper use in this in this neighborhood. So the question I, I would is, can the land? This, yeah, uh, can it? Yield a reasonable return. Yeah, I, I think in this case, by granting the variance, uh, it, it would uh, help to make this proper this property uh, uh, you know, yield. And again, looking at strictly from a business point of view now, which this is, you know, yes, this would uh, yield a good a good re reasonable return, and there is no uh, way that it can be uh, achieved uh, in a way that's consistent with the character of this district. Otherwise. And what evidence are we kind of looking at here when, when the two of you are kind of saying that you don't you don't feel that without this variance, this property, I, I, I'm not sure how the fact how long it's been on the market to me influences my decision. Um, I'm wondering what evidence you're looking at that she's presented tonight that says there's no other use for this. I mean, my understanding is that there have been businesses that have worked here since the change. Oh, I think um, you have to look at it uh, in that way, certainly. But and at the same time, we have to look at what's suitable in that neighborhood. And that's, again, we look at the definition of the zone. Mm -hmm. uh, that, 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 to me, that provides a lot of definition uh, as to what's a proper use in here. I and I think this is certainly a proper use of daycare business. Well, I have a question, too, to, to uh, Mr. Longstaff. Uh, the, the duration of vacancy affecting this building, um, would that affect the current use and would that need, you know, if, if it was sitting vacant long enough, would it still need to come back into compliance with that $40,000 uh, 40, rule? Not if the, Even I, I don't believe it use. would, and, and the reason I say I don't believe it would is that we do have in our non-conforming use section a statement that says should a non-conforming use be discontinued for more than 12 months, it cannot be reestablished unless it receives approval through the Board of Appeals for That's what I was looking for. A resumption of a, of a non-conforming. But this isn't a, there, there hasn't been a non-conforming use. The lot is non-conforming. Gotcha. Okay. The use has been fine. Okay. Um, so it, that doesn't really apply. So no matter how long it sits vacant, that's not, not an issue. Okay. But now to convert from whatever that existing use was to a daycare center facility that says it has to have the 40,000 square feet, the minimum lot size, it doesn't allow um, for it otherwise, mm -hmm. that's, that's a particular use. But I, I also do agree that because of the, um, I think because of the way that the use chart is laid out in the Running Hill 2 district, um, certainly a, a, a single family dwelling would have to meet that 40,000 square feet. Right. There because it wasn't ever used as a... Yeah. But if it were to maintain its current use as just a yeah, I think any commercial building, they I, can get value. I really think that. any commercial use probably could go in there. It's the daycare center facility right. performance standards that require it to have that minimum lot size. Right. But um, accord, uh, according to the RH2, I mean, the rules, are we I mean, they change... The I think we closed. I'm sorry. No. Oh, where no. are we? we? Yeah, we're in the finding of facts. Okay, so we actually facts. have closed sorry. off okay. testimony. Yeah. I'm sorry. Sorry. No, I'm. It's. it's, it's had a long, I've sorry. had a long. No, I've had a long day. To be I'll honest, so <laughs> I'm like. Um. Okay. So, but if someone wanted to come in, and run a property service management company with they three could. employees, they could do that. What, what the restriction here? I feel like. I feel like. I'm trying to evaluate the evidence that's been presented to me yeah. tonight here. And um, 
Yeah, I'm You've trying to determine the leniency we can actually have with this particular rule because I really do, I, I believe that this is, the use that's proposed is consistent with the res, with the Running Hill District ordin ordinances, um, you know, with, with what the intent and the purpose was and, and, you know, it meets the color. It's, it fits. And the question is, can we legitimately approve it based on this criteria? Because it is a stretch in a bit. Um, well, well, exactly. And again, I think it's important for the board to, you know, we have to evaluate the evidence that's presented to us tonight. And, you know, my understanding is that there have been other businesses that have operated there with this limited septic issue, and they've been able to do that. Um, I, I, I understand the fact that maybe it's been on the market for a while and they are trying to get a, re a return on the fact that it's been on there for a while. Um, but uh, yeah. that's kind of where I'm struggling. Um, I'm sorry. Mr. Howe, did you have anything you wanted to contribute? So uh, just, just to understand, there, there's, no, there's no grandfather There is not. No. That was then exceeded for twelve months of vacancy, or no. that changes things. No. That not in not, not in this case because of that standard in the daycare center facilities performance standards. It says it has to have the minimum lot size plus so many square feet per child. Per child. That's a, that's a standard that's specific to the daycare center facility. I'm not sure I can answer the question if she was proposing some other use. But we're not looking at some other use. We're only trying to determine can can this use meet that no reasonable return clause? And I think um, I'm sorry, Madam Chair, if if, if you don't mind, <laughs> please, please, I'm sorry, sorry. Uh, no Mr. Okay. Weinstein. How how long did you say that it has been on that you've been trying to market it? And you haven't had anything. <coughs> you haven't had, had various prospects, but none. Yeah. Of the okay. Of the yeah. Okay. Thank you. I'm sorry, but I don't know if you had any anything else. Um, I'm still kind of thinking. I'm gonna. Why don't I pass to? Thank you. I am struggling. To, um, to validate the evidence. Um, I was hopeful when I heard the discussion of the 40,000, <laughs> but then knowing that there is still the opportunity for existing or similar uh, business um, commercial to still occupy the space, uh, I'm stuck. Or I'm not stuck, but I'm unable to cross that threshold. It's, it's difficult. Um, as an attorney, I think you can understand that we have these criteria that we need to go through, and um, you know, it's our interpretation of reasonable return. Um, the law is non-conforming, and it has supported business offices, the Stearns Property Services, followed by retail sales and personal ser service businesses. Um, the minimum lot size for a private on-site subservice wastewater disposal system is 20,000 square feet. And this lot, I believe it said, has 29,499 square feet. And there's currently a system designed for 72 gallons per day with a 750 gallon septic tank. And the lot is serviced by public water supply. Um, so I, I know she's. Uh, regarding the septic, she has, she has obtained a proposal for a 776 gallon tank. Okay. So that, that does lead me to, you know, we're still fighting on this, on this 11,000 square foot difference, but not even, but uh, but I think she's you know she's figured out a way around the, the septic system issue. It's just a matter of well, and Mr. Lonstaff, are you able to point to me where it says that if it's the same exact use that can go in? Because the tattoo parlor was in in play before the regulations changed. The regulations changed in 2014, which made it then that they any of these uses 
under the RH2 district would need 40,000. And that's any use, single family, two family, non-residential, mixed uses. So it's never been used as a building after the ordinance changed or the zoning regulations changed. I just wanted to make that point clear. The zoning regulations were adopted in 2014. Right. And this and, building. And the tattoo parlor was there after it was, 2014. But it was there prior to. Yep. So it, it's pre existing. It, the fact, yeah. right. So it was a pre existing. Right. So. But. I, I'm not sure we I think, should be debating. I think those, those space and bulk standards were there if you're going to create a lot in the RH2 district. This was an existing lot of record back in, in 1995. And so in the non-conforming section, it says you can put any use on a property as long as you can meet the setbacks. <coughs> the daycare center facility has specific lot requirements right. that no, are specific to that. that. That's, the, that's, have... that's the distinction that I'm trying to make. Okay. Again, we've, I think <coughs> we've evaluated the evidence that we've, Mr. Yeah, just, Mr. Hebert. Just one quick thing, I mean, regardless, it can yield a reasonable return because it can still remain as its current function in its place. There is still that return that is there. Whether or not it's in um, a popular location or not, it's still a building that can still function as a commercial business, whether it's a property management or a tattoo parlor or something else. And that's right. And I, I feel like I'm the sorry. issue. No, no. And I feel like a, I don't know. I'm looking for more evidence. You know. No, I. I you I, know. Uh, I, I don't know what it's been priced. Maybe it's overpriced. And so that's the reason it's been on the market for so long. I mean, there's many, there's a lot of factors here in regards to reasonable return. Um, all in favor of A being met. And those opposed. And now. Can I just say one thing? I'm, I'm really sorry. Please. <laughs> yeah. I, 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 you know. I mean, I understand what you're, what you're saying, but basically, I mean, in order for anybody to use this building, I mean, it's, it's well, a very, I understand that, you know, it's been used as a tattoo parlor before, but that was before the zoning regulations changed for Running Hill in 2014. And it's been used as a property management company, all of which have, have moved on to different locations that had different septics, different uh, designs for the building. Um, or it was a property management company that had trucks all over the all over the yard. Um, you know, there there really isn't. And if you look at all the other uses that are in the Gorham Transition District RH2, if you wanted to change to any of those uses, and that's even something as simple as a public utility facility, nursing home, boarding care facility for elderly, doggy daycare, in-home business, non-municipal government office, elementary, libraries, museums single family dwelling, two family dwelling, anything like that, it can't be used as that unless it meets the 40,000. Madam Chair. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so you asked lot. where it is in the ordinance. No, under section three, nonconformance. Nonconforming lots of record, okay? In any district, a single lot of record at the effective date of adoption or amendment of this ordinance may be built upon, even though such lot fails to meet the minimum requirements for lot area or lot width which are, are applicable in the district, provided such lot is in separate ownership and not of continuous frontage with any other lot or lots in the same ownership. Such lot shall conform to all other requirements not involving lot area or lot width for the district in which it is located unless a variance from such other requirements is obtained from the Board of Appeals pursuant to Section 5B3, which is where we are tonight. Okay, and we just mm -hmm. voted on that. Um, procedurally, do we keep going or B? Uh, yeah, you should keep okay. finding. Yep. So B, the need for a variance is due to the unique circumstances of the property and not to the general conditions in the neighborhood. Uh, yes, uh, as discussed, um, the unique circumstance of the property is that it's not 40,000 square feet, therefore it limits any sort of change to operation on that site. Do you, do you feel that we've, we've received information and evidence tonight in regards to the general condition of the neighborhood? I don't know, Mr. Longstaff. My understanding is that there are other lots in the area that do contain less than 40,000 square feet. It's a mixed bag. There are about three lots right in that stretch of road that don't have 40,000 square feet, and there's about three lots that do have 40,000 square feet. What's that? So 
it's it's a mixed bag. I can't say that it's Appreciate unique, um, but it's certainly it, it's 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 a it's a coin toss. Well, that is a, that is another valid question. Though. Is there are there other daycare centers or child care centers or anything like that that are, are that are not meeting that forty thousand square foot? No. And I, th I think what's important, Ms. Torrance, is we've received no evidence tonight answering, I think, all of these questions. Yeah. And I think that's what's important for us here as the board is we really need to evaluate the evidence that's presented to us tonight. And that's mm -hmm. kind of what I was sticking with in the first one. And this is what I'm saying in the second one is I don't know this area at all. I can only evaluate the information that I've provided to me. My, and my lack, little information I know is all these lots are all over the place. And they're different sizes. There's different uses. Um, uh, so, if Ms. Gallagher wanted to right. table this and and exactly. seek other other supporting evidence, would would the board be open to that? And would you be open to that? I, I mean, I'm under contract, so I mean, at this point, there's not, and I don't know what evidence, honestly, I can present to you. I mean, other than showing. You know, it's my understanding that the tattoo parlor was there, it was there, and the, the septic wasn't ultimately big enough for them to have it. Now they've moved to Route 1 in Scarborough. I mean, that's, that's and we can, and we showing that the, the businesses that have been there, yes, there was a property management company, but they owned the building and they lived there and they had that there, the property management. Other than that, um, there really, there has to be a change of use of that building in order to have a reasonable return on the building. I'm having a hard time finding the evidence supporting that. Um, Mr. Mr. Hebert. I mean, I'm not sure what else I can do, except it's it's all a matter of interpretation yeah. and yeah. what moderate is. And what we're doing our finding of facts and conclusions of law is we have to Believe evaluate. Me, I think, I don't think there's anybody up here sitting here that doesn't want to approve this for you. Okay. That's the, the hard part. The, so then we're on number two. Mm -hmm. Correct. Again, the need for the variance is due to the unique circumstance of the property. Yes, that is correct. Uh, the criterion apprised to the property, not the people, or to an uncommon condition not shared by the neighborhood. It is due to the unique circumstance of the property. Yes, mm -hmm. it is under 40,000 square feet, which really limits them to what kind of operation that they can have there. Correct. Except for what is currently existing. I, I agree, it's because, because of the uh, specific uh, requirements of a uh, daycare business uh, that, uh, that that specification comes into play, if I'm not mistaken. <coughs> but other businesses uh, might uh, qualify for this property. Okay, so again, I've had a long day. So basically what you're saying is we're here because she wants to have a daycare and Yes. It's That's what creates the unique circumstances right. is the actual use of what it's she's asking to use. It, where yes. if it was just a retail, as we said, a retail sale, a property management, <laughs> that would be supported mm -hmm. currently. Agreed. Okay. Mr. Howell? It would have to be the exact no, same use. What's that? Uh, nothing. Okay. Nothing. Mr. Yeah, Again, I want to clarify. It wouldn't have to be the exact same use. I'm going back to oh, the like daycare use. center facility requiring right. 40,000 square feet. Period. Period. Yes, this is just daycare centers, nursery schools. We're not here to hear right. any of the other uses. We know the daycare center facility requires 40,000 square feet, period, plus 75 square feet per child over that, so over 12. So that's why we're, we're here. I don't, I don't think it matters to the board what other uses could or couldn't be there. Exactly. It's Except this that use. That particular yeah. ordinance doesn't yeah. work. Yeah. Right. Do you have further? No, I, I just that's that's basically the the issue that I come back to too is that it's it is just it's that limitation of for daycare centers facilities yeah. and and nursery schools that that leads us into this this quagmire where we want to be able to approve it but we can't right. we just can't. Mr. Karen, I agree. Nothing further to add. All in favor of B being met. One, two, three. Can we have that vote again, please? The need for the variance is not inherent. What's the number here? We've got two. Okay. No. Oh, How many? Four. Four? Four. Four. Yes. One against? Okay. That's what I'm trying to We're trying to Thanks. record the vote. Sorry. <laughs> the draft is not question. helpful tonight. Well, 
Very good. Thank you. <laughs> that the, uh, C, that the granting of the variance will not alter the essential character of the locality. Uh, no, it would not. And what they're proposing there would be in uh, would be in alignment with the essential character of the neighborhood based on the mixed use that's throughout that zone. Agreed. As a matter of fact, I think it's uh, by pointing out uh, how this is zoned, uh, it fits right in. Yeah. Unfortunately, it's because of the unique characteristics of the lot that, uh, that we haven't developed. Okay. Yeah, I think it's very consistent. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Didn't, didn't mean to jump my thing. Yeah. Yeah, he said nothing. He said nothing further. Yeah, no, I just, it, I think it, it, the, the character is very consistent and amenable to what's what's current there and, and um, probably more so than what has been in there in the past. Mm -hmm. But, um, Mr. Karen? I agree, but I have nothing further to add. Yep, daycare facilities are permitted, um, permitted in non residential uses in the R2, RH2 district. And the district is considered a business district, and I think Mr. Longstaff read that to us, kind of what's going on in that district. All in favor of C being met. Five. D, the hardship is not the result of an action taken by the applicant or prior order. Owner. No, uh, because the applicants stated that they haven't purchased the property. They're in negotiations for or pending the approval of the applicant. Agreed. Agreed. Yeah, the only the only fault of the prior owners is that they didn't have a daycare facility prior to <laughs> to the passing of the, the forty thousand ordinance. Mr. Karen. I agree. It's not an action of the applicant. May, may I ask you a question? Mm -hmm. Yeah. The original approval for the, the business was a daycare. Back. That never got started. That never. As far as I can tell, there was an approval for one. It never was built or used as one. So it was the file hard. contains a document that said there was approval, and that was prior to 95. The first plans and, and building permit were for Stern's property management in and around 1995. The daycare center facility was approved somewhere around 92 or 93. But it was never. For a day, no, for a no CO. Well, and even if there was, well, they had an interrupted yeah. use. It's unfortunate. I mean, right. that that might have been a that might have been, been a loophole. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I mean, the, the zoning ordinance requires that daycare center facilities be located only on lots that meet the minimum area and road frontage requirements for the zone. Other permitted non-residential uses do not have to have all the same limitations placed on them. All in favor of D being. I'll move to approve appeal number 2674 as presented. Second. All in favor? No, it's opposed. Sorry. Now we're just going to do the approval yeah. of the minutes and the appeals from last month. Did everyone have the time to review the minutes from the meeting of October 9th? Yes. Did anyone yes. have any questions or concerns? No. Do I have a motion? Motion to approve. Second. Second. All in favor. Okay. And then we have. 
decision for variance appeal 2662 for 6 Champion Street. Did everyone have a chance to review it? Have any questions, concerns? No. None. Okay. <laughs> 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 motion to approve. Motion to approve. Motion to approve. Second. Second. All in favor? Should ask Aye. if there's any discussion. <laughs> oh, I, I say, do they have any questions or concerns, yeah. I guess? I guess but the motion, then there's a, a second, then discussion, then approval. That's Thank the, you. Come on. <laughs> Long day. Long Cut day. her some slack. Who knows how tired I am now? Either that or give her chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So we have the draft decision for appeal 2667 for 5 Tasker Avenue. This is the one that we just... Uh, right. Correct. Do I have a motion? Motion to approve. Second. Do we have a discussion? No. None. I think we already did it. All in favor? <laughs> for appeal number 2668, which is 370 Payne Road. Do I have a motion to approve? Motion oh. to approve the miscellaneous appeal 2668 as written. Second. Any discussion, comments? All in favor? I have decision for 2669, 8 Arbor View Lane for a special exception permit approval. Do I have a motion? Move approve. Second. Any discussion? No. No. All in favor? We have appeal number 2670 for 4 Ward Street for a limited reduction of yard size. I have a motion. Motion to approve appeal 2670 as written. And second. Discussion? Questions? Concerns? No. All in favor? With appeal number 2671 for 8 C Rose Lane, which is a limited reduction of yard size. Mm -hmm. Motion. Motion to approve the, the limited reduction of yard size appeal 2671 as written. I'm second. Any discussion? All in favor? <laughs> okay. Is there anything else, Mr. Longstaff? No, I uh, would just offer that, you know, when you're going through this process of approving these, dr these uh, uh, draft findings and conclusions during that discussion period, if you read them and if you have anything to add, that's the time to do it. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, get, I, get, I do get a little bit nervous. It, it kind of starts to feel like a rubber stamp, and that may not necessarily be a good thing. So, sir, okay. I mean, it's, it's fine if you're fine with it. Don't get me wrong. That's great. Right. But please take advantage of an opportunity to add anything that you feel was missed or uh, anything yeah. like that. That's that's the process. I just that's, want to make it. That's true. Yeah. But it's incumbent upon us to read the correct exactly the yeah the findings first. And again, the, the process the we go through yeah. as staff is we review the the tape, we review what notes we took, we craft them and try to you know formulate it into a nice something that's understandable. But we might not exactly get it right, you know. Um, so that's your opportunity to make sure that it's right. And if it is, fine. We're, we're happy about that. But please don't feel like you don't have the opportunity to make a change. Make a change. Or, or, exactly. or a correction. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Hey, can I have one last, one last thing? I guess with, and very evident by this last appeal tonight with the, with the variance appeal, it's, impor it's really important for us to... Um, I'll say just be very uh, as objective as possible and like when we're speaking to them trying to I, I won't say keep keep like we want you know everyone's a very like nice person we want to be nice to the folks who are coming up here but keeping in mind that and I almost and, and I'm, I'm guilty of it myself sometimes being sidetracked about what the actual question is and what they're asking for um, you know the reasonable return is the reasonable return for any sort of thing that's going on in that property right there and sometimes even though you really don't want to in your heart you have to look at what's right there in front of you and say no they have to do it this way so we have to vote a certain way mm -hmm. based on the information in front of us and that's what the lawyer 
from the town have gone through and instructed us on. So it's important I, for me seeing that through the years that I've done this, a couple years I've done this already is just just staying to what's written on paper. If they don't have enough information, then we tell them to go back and try again. Or, in the case of some, they have their one shot to bring up everything they want on this. It's not fair mm -hmm. for to table and go on to something else and mm -hmm. then delay everybody else for another hour or two hour long discussion right. at the next meeting, right. pushing other people off on it. These people, especially people who have been here before us multiple and times, knows. they know, know the, the exact rules. process and they know exactly what they need to provide in order for us to make a decision on it. And if they don't, the onerous is on them. So yeah. that's their problem. We can only judge and make our decisions on the information right in front of us. So that's just my, my two cents. Yes. You're going to hear me say evidence a lot. No, we can only give you evaluate the evidence they give us. I have a motion to adjourn. Oh, add something? Before, yeah, I just like to make a comment. Yeah, yeah. Uh, with with the, uh, the champion appeal, uh, what, what happened on that one was very interesting because it was tabled so many times, and then finally they got an attorney uh, who did a very good job uh, researching case law to the point that we were able to look at that and take it into consideration. I think a lot of times people come before us, and they may have a lot of uh, experience before board, but they don't necessarily bring, bring a lawyer in right away, unless advocating that they do in every case. But you know, it's, it's incumbent upon them to figure that out. I mean, if they think they need one, that's up to them. If they're not ready, mm -hmm. then they should table it uh, and, uh, and ask for you know, continuation and, yeah. and become prepared, better prepared the next time to be able to make the case. Mm -hmm. And that's really what happened tonight with Tasker. It's just they didn't, you know, they didn't, you know, weren't able to convince us in any way. Yeah. So. Motion to adjourn. Second. All in favor. All in favor. <laughs>